This is the sound of turning ideas into software. This is the sound of engineering and passion. Work. Work more. Work harder. Experiment. Build. Break. And build again. Write code. Improve it. Job done. Celebrate. Insurance. Finance. Retail. Defense. Robotics. Energy. Amethyx. Welcome back to another episode of Data Science at Home podcast. I'm Francesco, podcasting from the regular office of Brussels City in uh, Belgium. Today I'm not alone. I'm with uh, Kevin McNamara from Parallel Domain. In fact, I'm with the founder and CEO of uh, Parallel Domain, uh, a company that does a very important thing. And uh, we're going to discuss about this uh, on this show. Uh, we're going to speak about synthetic data and much, much more. Hi, Kevin. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And uh, indeed, we are going to discuss about something uh, that here on Data Science at Home podcast, we have discussed already a number of times, but I keep hitting the topic because I'm very passionate about it. And uh, also because I do believe about the need uh, of for synthetic data. Uh, now, before getting into details, um, you know, and the nitty gritty of how synthetic data are generated in many sectors out there, uh, would you mind giving an introduction about yourself on the show? Of course. Yeah, really quick intro. My name is Kevin. I'm founder and CEO at Parallel Domain. We're a synthetic data company, and we're going to dive into uh, what that means today and kind of everything about big data for machine learning. So we'll get to that later. But my background is in, in computer graphics and, and AI. So I came up through uh, 3D rendering, actually, places like Pixar and Microsoft Game Studios. And then before I started Parallel Domain, I was at Apple Special Projects Group working on their autonomous systems project. And then it was it's over five and a half years now um, ago that I left Apple and started Parallel Domain. And so we'll get into the nitty gritty of that soon. But I'm really happy to be here talking about synthetic data. That's amazing. That's a very nice journey indeed. Um, Kevin, I am uh, very curious to know from you. Um, about, of course, uh, data-hungry companies. Um, more and more companies out there um, have a, a massive, uh, have, have a big requirement, which is massive amounts of, uh, of data. And this goes pretty much across sectors. I can speak about, for example, uh, financial technology, uh, as well as healthcare, for example, robotics, uh, and I can go on and on with the list. So my question to you is, um, what do companies need from their data? And in particular, the data hungry companies, how do they deal with that? Right. And that's, that's going to be the crux, I think, of a lot of our discussion today is around this idea that you know, companies developing cutting edge software today are, are typically using machine learning, right? And I think everybody listening to this podcast is probably fairly well versed in the fact that machine learning actually needs data to learn. Um, and, and at the end of the day, companies developing really complex software today are using machine learning and therefore need lots of data to train those models. The problem is that it's really hard to get enough data and the right data, and then to get it quickly enough to actually deploy products to market on time. And a lot of the discussion we'll have today will focus on you know, perception, computer vision, autonomous systems, robotics, things like that. And so we can get into the details of those specific use cases soon. But actually, the, the broad trend or, or the commonality across anybody really training machine learning models is that getting enough data to train a great model and getting the right data to train a great model is typically the biggest bottleneck. Um, and, and the biggest problem with not being able to get that data is speed. It's development speed, right? We like to use this analogy that, uh, you know, we used to program, or we do still program computers explicitly with software engineers. We write lines of code and the computers follow those instructions. But there's been this kind of revolution into machine learning where we now teach computers by example. Um, the, the iteration cycle for software development today is how quickly can you train and test and deploy a machine learning model? Whereas it used to be how quickly can you write code, run it through the unit tests and deploy that software. So at the end of the day, being able to get the right data quickly is a direct correlation to how fast you can iterate on developing software. And so the biggest problem about getting data today is, is development speed. And so data hungry companies are moving more slowly than they want to because they can't get the data they need fast enough. 
And what do companies do today? They throw a lot of money at the problem. They throw a lot of people at the problem. But that actually, at the end of the day, doesn't really speed things up. You know, some companies are getting the data that they need to progress forward at a slow pace. But we're going to talk a lot about autonomous driving today. And everybody's asking, like, you know, where the hell is autonomous driving? Like, everybody thought that would be done and solved by, you know, 2020. If you look at some of the old predictions from autonomy companies. And the reason that progression has been so slow is it turns out actually getting the right data to train, test, and deploy machine learning models, especially in safety critical applications, takes a really long time. So that's the core like pain point that we're really here to solve as a company. So indeed, the right data uh, in a decent time, of course, that's kind. Of, these are the two variables, uh, the moving variables for a data hungry company uh, of today. That's for sure. So I guess my next question is about, uh, you know, the right data uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, we are talking about synthetic data. We're talking about fake data. You know, it, it, I know it's a bad, it's a bad word. It's a bad term these days, fake data. But in fact, it's data that does not exist. It has been created artificially. Uh, now, does it work? The really short answer is yes, absolutely. And so that's the easy part. Um, I think there's a lot of nuance in, in the different ways that it works. And there's some very exciting things we're going to talk about today, but also uh, we'll, we'll talk about some links to places that our, the listeners can follow up and read examples of how not only our synthetic data, but synthetic data in general has been driving leaps forward in, in machine learning. And like you mentioned earlier, it's, it's not a matter of getting the most data. It's a matter of getting the most right data. So if you're trying to train a computer vision system to recognize emergency vehicles, it doesn't really matter how many pictures you have of uh, bicycles, right? You need some to All teach right. the model the difference between a bicycle and an ambulance, but then it really matters how many pictures of ambulances you have. And so a lot of the, the com companies we work with, our customers, but a lot of people doing things in machine learning today are really finding that getting the right samples of data to train the model for the task they care about is one of the hardest things. And actually that's where synthetic data really shines, right? That's where synthetic data can enable us to generate specific examples of the things people need by setting rules, right? That say every sequence out of the 100,000 sequences this customer is generating right now, make sure the synthetic data system inserts an ambulance somewhere in that sequence, right? And then we can guarantee that the customer is getting the right data instead of just lots of random data. Now, when we talk about data, of course, we're being very uh, generic on purpose, I must say, uh, because there is data and data, you know, uh, there is a different types of data. So what type of data are we talking about? Uh, are we talking about, you mentioned uh, computer vision data, for example, uh, but I believe there are uh, tabular data when it comes to formats, for example, there is sensors data when it comes to, or perception when it comes to um, uh, autonomous vehicles or robotics, for example, there's weather data. Um, so what are the data types and formats that Parallel Domain is providing synthetic data for? Parallel Domain is all about perception data. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm really glad we're now starting to get more specific. There are a lot of commonalities we can draw across machine learning, across all types of data, but the discussion today really is about perception data. And we use that word intentionally because perception is a superset of computer vision, right? Perception is really using any type of sensor to perceive the environment around you. It can be a camera, it can be LIDAR, it could be radar, sonar, thermal imaging. It could even be a, a sensor for pressure or temperature or something that is, is perceived some kind of change in the environment or some kind of condition in the environment. Uh, and so that's what parallel domain is focused on is perception data, primarily camera, LIDAR, and radar today, but that is expanding over time. What we're not going to be talking about, at least at a detailed level today, is things like tabular data, financial information. Um, there are other companies that do that. There is a whole, a whole world of synthetic data for what you'd call structured data, you know, tables of data, that's structured data. Today, it's going to be a lot of discussion about unstructured data and typically data coming from sensors. Yeah, I'm glad that you make that distinction because I was already <laughs> trying to be, you know, to go into the the really the nitty gritty of the methodologies because they are indeed very, very different. You know, when you when you generate synthetic data, unstructured synthetic data are completely different story than unstructured tabular data or structured data. That's um, exactly. And one of the lenses that you can see it through is 
the use case we're really trying to accelerate is helping both people and machines see the world around them better and see again through any type of sensor that that might be useful for that application. But if that's the problem trying to be solved, then that's where you can apply what we're going to talk about today. Nice. Um, Kevin, there is something that uh, honestly, uh, I struggled finding something, you know, tangible online uh, <laughs> in terms of blog posts or, you know, resources. Uh, I would like to know some, and I believe that many of listeners of this show would like to uh, to know the same, uh, you know, some of the good practices you would recommend to, for example, machine learning engineers when using synthetic data, because, you know, uh, these people all of a sudden in the last few years have been uh, put in front of, you know, uh, the real data and the synthetic data as well. Uh, so, you know, uh, are there good good practices that they can learn from? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so I'll talk through some of those now. Also, if people want to follow up after the episode, um, you can head to our website. We have documentation there, which actually has some best practices for machine learning on it. Um, you can sign up for an account and go access that documentation. It's free. Um, and so we'll 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 put out some links in our posts, our social media posts and things once we publish the episode as well to help guide people. But to get right to the answer, there are absolutely a handful of things that uh, we have we have found through our work internally, we have a whole machine learning research team, as well as many, many customers that we work with that tend to give much better results with synthetic data, some do's and don'ts, right? So the first thing to consider is what task are you trying to develop for? Are you doing semantic segmentation? Are you doing object detection or depth estimation or motion prediction and tracking through occlusions, which is some research our customers have done before? That's the first question, because then you've got a bit of a branching tree of decisions to make from there. And the, the first big branch is whether or not the task you're doing is a high density task, like depth and semantic segmentation, where you're actually making a prediction for every pixel. You're trying to say, is that pixel a car or road? Is that pixel five meters or 10 meters away? That's a dense task. A sparse task would be object detection with 2D bounding boxes. You know, you might have four or five predictions in a given frame rather than 5 million, you know, one for every pixel. And the, the way that you approach training models with synthetic data for those two tasks is slightly different. We do find that out of the box, our synthetic data makes massive improvements on object detection with very little domain adaptation. For example, our data is realistic enough and the distributions are well enough calibrated that our customers can typically take their real data and our synthetic data, train a model together and get some improvements there for object detection. Some of our customers are training on pure synthetic data as well, which is great. Um, so I'll give some detail there on some best practices too in a second, but on the other side of the branch with semantic segmentation, depth estimation, optical flow, we do find that there are some domain adaptation techniques that really help boost performance here. And um, we do have those documented uh, on the website, people can check it out, but things like the advent networks and FADA and um, unsupervised domain adaptation, we actually just published a blog post on unsupervised domain adaptation that you can check out on our website that walks through some of this. So for those dense tasks, we're finding some, some level of domain adaptation architecture really helps rather than just trying to train on the raw data straight out of the gate without any, any adaptation. Um, and then the other thing we find is across the board, no matter what kind of task you're trying to train for, the mix of data really matters, right? So some of our customers are training on pure synthetic data. So in that case, there's not much of a mix to consider, but the customers that already have real data, it's really important that you prescribe the right mix. And I, I often like to use that word prescribe because it kind of is like really powerful medication. You need somebody who has used synthetic data and understands how to use it well, like a doctor, right? Like a data doctor almost to prescribe the right mix. Otherwise it's dangerous and you may actually get results that you don't intend. For example, if you have a whack of real data, let's say a hundred thousand images of real data. If you only add a thousand images of synthetic data, the model is not going to get better because what it's going to do is actually learn that there's a hundred thousand images that look like this. There's a thousand images that look similar, but are a little bit different. And it's not going to generalize across the two data sets. Instead, if you have a mix that's closer to 50, 50, where there's a, a 
very significant chunk of synthetic and real data, and the model is kind of forced to learn from them both equally, we find that gives much better results. And we've had some customers recently doing object detection, and these are customers working in driver assistance at like a production level and um, boosting their object detection performance by like 54% um, using our synthetic data. But the mix has to be, you know, at a significant ratio, you know, 30, 70, 60, 40, 50, 50, something in that ballpark um, well, really matters. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point that you're raising now, because uh, what happens, for example, in uh, rare events, in the case of rare events, uh, you know, if you uh, mix, if you have, if you use the wrong mix of synthetic data for rare events and original data in which, of course, you have, you know, rare events, so you, you are supposed to have very few samples in the real world, uh, you know, aren't, aren't you artificially blowing the, the rate, um, you know, if you use a, a bad mix between synthetic and, and so you're you are in fact making rare events very common, actually. Exactly. Yeah, that's a, it's a really uh, astute point because actually one of our blog posts for cyclist detection does exactly this. Um, when you're out in the real world collecting data, you see, you know, for, for any given second driving on the road, you see tons of cars, maybe you see one or two bicycles. So you end up with, you know, 98% of your vehicles on the road you've detected are cars and trucks and vans, and like 2% are bicycles. And so what we did in that case is we generated a data set that flipped that distribution and had 98% bicycles, 2% cars. Then when you mix that data together, you've balanced those two classes. You actually get much, much better performance on that rare class. And we actually boosted performance on the vehicles slightly as well. That's a, a blog post that's up on our website. Now, to your point, you know, it's like, well, are you actually then for that given class, the samples are like 90% synthetic, 2% real, which is the opposite for cars. And um, in that case, it's okay, because the model is learning from an approximately equal amount of synthetic images and real images. Um, so one of the issues that we run into is the model actually learns to segment data sets if they are vastly different sizes. Um, but if you have an approximately equal number, number of overall images, and then there's a higher distribution of synthetic samples for a given class, um, we found that that still does work quite well. Well, that's a very interesting conversation. Of course, I wish we had like three hours for this show <laughs> to go through the whole The people that do have three hours, head to our website, the documentation blog posts up there, and there's going to be a lot more coming out soon. Oh, from yeah, our for sure. Team, and so. Of course, we're going to report also all the links that you've mentioned uh, on the show notes of this episode for convenience. Uh, you know, it's always good to uh, provide to the listeners uh, the, the other material that we usually, uh, you know, discuss on this show uh, by voice and unfortunately we cannot go too deep into the conversation for obvious reasons of course um kevin of course we know that there are several methods to generate data you know i would like to uh you know please the the practitioners and the researchers out there <laughs> and and the nerds out there we love nerds <laughs> So we, you know, I would like to switch gears and, and speak about some of the technicalities behind a synthetic data generation. And now let me tell you something important. Cyber criminals are evolving. Their techniques and tactics are more advanced, intricate, and dangerous than ever before. Industries and governments around the world are fighting back, unveiling new regulations meant to better protect data against this rising threat. Today, the world of cybersecurity compliance is a complex one, and understanding the requirements your organization must adhere to can be a daunting task. But not when the pack has your back. Arctic Wolf, the leader in security operations, is on a mission to end cyber risk by giving organizations the protection, information, and confidence they need to protect their people, technology, and data. Their new interactive compliance portal helps you discover the regulations in your region and industry and start the journey toward achieving and maintaining compliance. Visit arcticwolf.com slash data science to take your first step. That's arcticwolf.com slash data science. Of course, there are, and we know, uh, statistical methods, for example, data that are generated from a statistical distribution, uh, as well as data that are generated by perturbation of real data or existing data. Uh, and then we have been reading and discussing this quite extensively in these last few weeks, probably, uh, which is generative models, um, or probably months. <laughs> and so the deep learning family of models, uh, in fact. 
Um, what happens at Parallel Domain? Uh, which methodology uh, did you guys marry? <laughs> if I can say that. Absolutely. We So I'll, I'll talk about what we do. Like you said, there's lots of different ways to generate different types of synthetic data. At Parallel Domain, we use a combination of 3D simulation and generative and deep learning techniques. And so let's dive into that. So the first thing that's really important, for, especially for the type of use case that we're chasing, is control and precision. So it's important that, for example, a um, we can replicate scenarios of jaywalkers walking across the street at a certain distance and a certain speed. It's important that we can put an ambulance into every image. It's important that you know traffic lights follow certain rules in our world so that we can help customers train systems for those cases. So 3D simulation is really well suited to that because you get a lot of control, right? And you get precision in the world and the world can follow logic and rules. With that said, one of the limitations of 3D simulation is the massive variety of crazy, pardon my language, but the massive variety of crazy shit that can happen out in the world is like pretty hard to go program explicitly. It's exactly the reason actually that machine learning is better at solving perception use cases than like a bunch of hard coded lines of code that try to describe different conditions, right? We need to be able to take examples from the real world and use that to inform the messiness and diversity and and wildness of, of the synthetic data. So what we found to be really powerful is this combination of base 3D simulation that describes the framework and the structure of the world. Where are the lanes? Where are the traffic lights? Where are the stop signs? Where are the crosswalks and the edges of buildings? But then using deep learning and especially, like you mentioned, some new leaps forward in generative AI, mostly based on these new found out foundational models, um, has been a huge leap forward for us in terms of the variety and diversity of data that we can generate. Um, probably by the time this, this podcast is published, we'll have some material out there about some, some new things that we've been working on. Um, we're extremely excited about this new ability to for lack of a, a different way to put it, kind of learn from the giant body of data that's on the internet, right? All the images and all the videos that people have captured of the real world. You know, we're primarily talking about, about real world footage and using that to inform the diversity and variety that gets generated in our world. And having generative AI essentially augment on top of the base 3D simulation, a lot of the details and variety that our customers need to, to deal with what is a pretty pretty diverse world. I see. So what's wrong with a pure deep learning based solution? The biggest problem we've run into, because we've done a lot of, we have a whole machine learning research team internally. One of the biggest problems we've run into there is, is lack of control is the first one, right? So you may get with a, a fully, if you're just doing purely generative networks, whether it's generative adversarial networks or the more foundational mod, foundational based models of, of today, in both cases, control is very difficult. So if you actually need to replicate certain scenarios, or if you say that scenario is great, but I want a hundred more by tweaking these variables. I want this one um, you know, with a different color and a different position and a different shape. Um, that becomes very difficult because a lot of the deep learning based techniques are a bit of a black box, right? Just like with deep learning and autonomy, one of the biggest problems is explainability and knowing why it's making the decisions it's making. Well, the same thing happens when you're using generative techniques to create synthetic data completely from scratch it's a little bit hard to get exactly what you want. And therefore then to ensure that you're getting the right variations to train a good model. So again, what we found is with 3D simulation, we can give the AI a scaffolding to build on top of. So that scaffolding is the control. It's like a paper mache almost where you like, you build the wireframe and you can control the world that way. And then you let the generative techniques kind of put the surface and put the skin on top of that. Um, and that gives that gives ends up giving a lot of control. The generative techniques can, if you're purely just using GANs, for example, the amount of variety and diversity and control you get eventually taps out the utility of the data, and your machine learning model performance will plateau at some point. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's in fact, you know, from a mathematical perspective, you are making an enormous um, and a super high dimensional model. Uh, you know, you're narrowing it down, and you are constraining a lot of these moving variables. And you know what what you just mentioned the scaffolding of the uh, of the model in fact is to allow the model to still generate diverse data but under control so to speak uh, so that it doesn't really diverge from how realistic that data will look like is, is that what you what you said I believe 
Yeah, that's right. And in a lot of cases, using the generative techniques on top of the 3D simulation is resulting in even more realistic data. And very exciting thing is that I talked about domain adaptation earlier. We're finding that with the right fine tuning of certain generative models, for example, if we have a customer that has a bunch of real world data that they've already collected, which is typically the case, we can fine tune our generative infrastructure on their data set just for them. So that then the data coming out of our generators much more closely matches their data from a color calibration, from noise, from image sharpness, blurriness, all those different characteristics. Um, and so what we're finding is that the generative techniques are actually helping us, if you do it right, with the right control and scaffolding in the background, can actually create even more realistic, even um, and, and narrow the domain gap even farther so that the data becomes even more valuable and useful. Very interesting. Uh, Kevin, I have some uh, I have a question, in fact, that uh, with which I've been struggling for for a long time, to be honest. Um, I, I I have to find the right words to put it. <laughs> so my I guess my speculation is the following. Imagine you are you know generating data, and of course, if you want this data to be uh, as realistic as possible, it means that the model that is generating this data has to be, uh, quite accurate, you know, a good representative of the natural phenomenon of the real world that you are indeed uh, simulating data from. Um, so which one comes first? Like if you have such a model, haven't you solved the problem already? It's, it, we were, as we were talking about earlier, I, I think this, this point of view is a really interesting one to debate because uh, I think Elon Musk even came out and said this at one of the Tesla AI days a few years ago. He said something along the lines of, you know, hey, well, if you build the most realistic simulator that's good enough to really train a self-driving system, then you pretty much solve the self-driving problem inside of the simulator. I think the really fun thing is that he came back the next year and almost all of the AI day was focused on how much they're using simulation to accelerate their uh, autopilot efforts. And I think the realization that he even had there was um, there's some breakdowns in that logic. And, and the first is that what we're really trying to do by training and testing machine learning models is teaching them the important boundaries and tent poles of the domain that they're trying to learn in. But we don't have all of the examples of everything that could possibly happen. And so we actually don't. We don't. Nobody does. No simulator can perfectly simulate the real world and every possible perturbation of what happens. But something we like to say is that with our synthetic data platform, we're generating lots of potential potential future states to help solve for whatever ends up being the one current reality that our customers um, end up encountering in the real world. And we, for example, let's take a jaywalker, right? We want to generate data of a jaywalker at all sorts of times a day, different angles, different clothing types, different body shapes, like everything that you could imagine is a different um, dimension for, for what could make for a different um, uh, final sensor frame of somebody crossing the road. We're going to generate enough different cases to teach a machine learning model the broad strokes of a person at night is still a person, a person in the day is still a person, a person with a jacket, without a jacket, et cetera. But we're not actually going to have every single possible combination of what happens. But that's the beauty of machine learning is it's actually quite good at extrapolating in between data points. And so the whole idea with synthetic data is that you are providing those in animation, you call them the kind of the keyframes, right? You provide the big moments that are important to learn about. And then all of the in-between frames, the variations, the interpolations between those keyframes, that's what the machine learning model is actually good at extrapolating. So when it sees something in the real world, that's not going to be exactly the same frame as what we generated, it can extrapolate to that next, next piece. Um, and in a lot of ways, our data generators they know enough to make lots of different conditions in the world, but given a current state of the world, our systems don't predict what's gonna happen next. And that's the part that a lot of our customers are trying to solve is then saying, hey, if I recognize what state I'm in, how do I predict what happens next? Um, that's where you know the simulators that are being built today don't, don't actually replicate reality. Right, well, indeed, in many cases, it's not necessary to replicate reality, uh, you know, 100%, exactly. that's for yep. sure. Uh, you mentioned customers, of course, uh, which is always a good thing for companies of this caliber and for any company out there. 
Um, now I would like to ask, uh, what are the typical use cases? And probably if you can cover the typical sectors that require synthetic data, and of course, in which parallel domain is playing a role. The three big sectors we're focused on today are automotive. And I say automotive intentionally because that includes level four and five autonomous vehicle companies, but it, it even more so includes driver assistance levels, you know, one through three autonomy, where people are doing things like backup cameras and lane keeping and obstacle avoidance. Um, so automotive is a big sector that we sell into today. It's where a lot of our customers are, and we'll, we'll keep supporting that sector and growing in that sector. We also work in delivery drones. So people trying to put packages and supplies um, into front yards, backyards, buildings, you know, delivering things. And then also now we're into mobile computer vision. So any kind of mobile device, whether that's a phone or glasses or a watch or something you wear um, that is perceiving the environment around you and helping you navigate that environment or perform tasks or, you know, um, get more information about what's around you. And those are the sectors we currently sell into today. Over time, we'd love to move into retail and manufacturing and agriculture and beyond. But it's really those three are a focus. Then some use cases. So what, what are customers actually doing with this data? Um, it's very common for people to be training models for detecting road users that are harder to see and typically more vulnerable. So you'll see like a vulnerable road user is, is a common term in the industry. This would be people on the side of the road, bicycles, cars pulled over, jaywalkers, Training detection, segmentation, and classification models to recognize those situations is super common. Um, traffic signs, there's a new regulation in the European Union, the ISA um, requirements that are forcing driver assistance systems to be able to recognize all of the traffic signs in all of the European Union countries. The combination of how many signs in countries, there's hundreds and hundreds of those. So a bunch of our customers have come to us for these big data sets of all those traffic signs. So they can train models to detect what signs they're seeing on the side of the road. Um, some other use cases, just to rattle through them, things like debris in the road, boxes and tires and branches that might fall into the road, um, construction sites, um, vehicle light classification, emergency vehicles, parking maneuvers, uh, and also trailers, like driver assistance systems for people towing trailers is actually a pretty common one that we see as well. So all of those different cases involve perception systems, trying to observe those type of situations and then help the driver make a safer decision. And that's, those are primary cases a lot of our customers use our data for. Interesting. Kevin, sold. I'm a new customer. <laughs> what happens next? Like what's the typical workflow at Parallel Domain? Imagine uh, someone subscribes, I guess, uh, you have an account uh, on your cloud. Where does the data, you know, how can I generate data to start with? What are the tools and the, and the things that I have to move in order to generate data? Um, and also, where is this data stored? Is data that belongs to me or is data that you are a custodian of? What's what's the, the model there? Right. right. Yeah. So let's say you're yeah, you're a new customer, you sign up for an account on the website and we get you onboarded. The first step will be to plug in your sensor information. Right. So maybe you're using one camera or maybe you're an automotive company that has eight cameras and two LIDAR and three radar, whatever that is. You plug that information to, into our sensor onboarding tools and we help you onboard also your labeling rules and your labeling ontology so that once you've completed that onboarding process, you can generate data from our platform that looks just like the data you would get from your sensors and your labeling setup. Once you've done that, you then can, you've got two main products to choose from. And it depends on whether you want to generate large batches of data with kind of distribution level control, statistical control over things or if you want really fine-grained recreation of specific scenarios that you care about. So that's your first kind of decision point. If you want big batches of data, that's uh, aptly named our batch product. And that's where you can actually tweak the distribution. What percentage of the data set should have highway driving, suburban driving, or urban driving? How much of it should be daytime, nighttime, dawn, or dusk, or rain, or fog, or different conditions? Um, and then within that, how often should we see different vehicle types? Um, and then in the last step, you have a choice of a bunch of different generators that I talked about. Things like construction sites, debris, parking, jaywalking, lane switching, emergency vehicle lights. These are all different generators that are pre-configured on our platform. And so you can say, I want 80% highway driving. 
I want, let's say 50% nighttime, and then I want construction sites and debris. So, you know, every sequence is going to have a construction site somewhere in it and some debris in it somewhere on the road. And so you're controlling things at a distributional level. Then you say, give me a hundred thousand frames of that. Give me X, Y, and Z label, you know, 3D bounding boxes and semantic segmentation. And then the system will go generate that for you. And that's all automated from, from the point that you submit. That data then shows up uh, on our platform, like in the cloud as uh, accessible through our data visualizers. And we actually just released a video, a demo video of this data visualizer. So um, we can point people to that later. Um, and you also then have access to that data and you can, you can copy it over to your own infrastructure and use it however you need to use it to train and test your own models. So that's the batch use case. The other side is step, and that's where you might want a lot more control, right? You don't want to just say, give me 100,000 highway construction sites. You might say, I want to be driving down this specific highway in this lane, and then I want a traffic cone here and a construction worker to walk across the road at this speed. Typically, this is aimed more at testing, right? Because you want to test a specific case, and you have maybe a testing suite of scenarios that you've already created, and you need the corresponding sensor data for those scenarios. So this is the step API and it's a live cloud API. You, you essentially write a line of code that says, give me step server. And it spins up a, a step server in our cloud and you send commands to that server that tell the server where everything is, right? I'm here, there's a construction cone here and there's the construction worker here moving at this speed. And the, in the API, you just control it like a hockey puck essentially. And then our system takes care of all of the 3D world creation, the animation of that pedestrian, the lighting, the rendering, the label generation, sensor data generation. So Step API is really tailored at people who have specific scenarios or scenario simulators already, and they want to get sensor data of those specific cases. I, get, I, I understand. So that's that's amazing, actually, because you have both cases, one for, you know, generate a N number of frames uh, as many as I need for my particular application or or model. Uh, the other is much more specific. For example, uh, I have a model. Uh, I would like to test it uh, a number of times on this particular scenario or this other particular scenario. I want you to create the data that represents that particular scenario as I described. Uh, that's cool. But in both cases, you don't need a user to have knowledge of, let's say, statistics or how to, you know, statistical distributions as well as uh, how to manipulate data, especially when it's like large volumes. Uh, you don't need those skills, right? It depends on how you look at it. So I would say on the one hand, no, you don't need them. If, for example, what you wanted to do was come onto the platform and get nighttime uh, sequences of cars pulling out of driveways. We have that our system can handle doing lots of variation within saying, give me 100% night and make sure there's a vehicle creeping out of a driveway in every data set. Our platform can generate that and give you a nice amount of variation within it. But with that said, if you're not paying attention, now this is going back to synthetic data needing to be somewhat prescriptive for your given situation. If you're not paying attention to the statistical distribution of the data that you already have, and then especially the distribution of, of data that you have in your test set and frankly, the domain that you're trying to deploy to, which is even more important than your test set. If you don't have a deep statistical understanding of what's in that data, you may go generate synthetic data sets that don't match that or don't complement that in a way that improves performance the way you want. And so this is where we do spend time with customers or we have a whole machine learning team that engages with our customers to help them understand here are the statistics in your current data set. Here are the statistics in a synthetic set that will give you maximum performance back. So that that is important to understand. It's not a requirement per se, because it wouldn't prevent you from actually using the platform, but it may limit the, the quality of the results you get if you don't pay attention to that. Makes sense. Kevin, who's behind Parallel Domain? I mean, this is the time to introduce probably or spend a few words about the team and their background, I guess. Of course, yeah. <laughs> Uh, if you ask me, I'm very biased. The the best people in the world are behind Parallel Domain. I really, it is like the the greatest, frankly, thrill of my entire career to get to work with this team. We're we're over 85 people now, and we are predominantly 
developers in some sense, people that are developing the technology. This runs the gamut from software engineers to AI and machine learning experts to uh, content creators that do things like 3D modeling and asset creation. Um, a lot of our people typically on the technical side either come from machine learning, autonomy, robotics, computer vision, or they come from computer graphics. I mean, video games, VFX, simulation, um, film, things like that. And, and our company, really, a lot of what we do is the confluence of AI and computer graphics, right? We're, we're asking the question, how can we use the most advanced computer graphics? And I include generative AI in the definition of computer graphics, by the way, because it's a computer generating graphics. How do we take the technology at the nexus of AI and computer graphics and use that to help train, you know, the future of, of machine learning systems? And so, yeah, the people that operate in that kind of overlap is, is what we have on our team. Um, and we're based mostly in California and Vancouver, Canada. Actually, most of our team is in Vancouver now. So uh, it's a very, very, very cool city. <laughs> I believe so. Well, no, it's uh, it's definitely a very good combination. And uh, to be honest with you, that's exactly what intrigued me the first time we we, we, we contacted each other. Uh, the combination between, um, you know, 3D graphics and machine learning uh, is something that, to the best of my knowledge, is uh, is quite unique, uh, and of course, uh, you are also mentioning uh, and and guaranteeing that it's also powerful uh, as a combination. Of course, we don't have the numbers here to to state or to make this claim. We strongly believe that's the case. Uh, it's a very interesting approach, in my opinion. Um, now, there's been there have been a lot of layoffs these days. Uh, are you guys hiring? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So please go to our jobs page. Um, we're in a very fortunate and strong position as a company. We just raised our Series B over the summer. Um, it was a $30 million Series B, and we just Congratulations. announced- Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're, um, given the current economic times and the struggles a lot of startups are having, we're, we're both thankful of, of being able to get that done, but I'm also just very proud of, of what the team has built that, that actually enabled us to go raise that money. Um so we're going to be here for the long haul. We're growing. Um, I think we've tripled the size of the team in the past 18 months. Um, so we are hiring, especially for roles that apply to a lot of the discussion we had today. You know, generative AI, machine learning, computer graphics um, are big focuses of ours. And so head over to our jobs page and there are a bunch of opportunities up there. And we will definitely add this link to the to the other ones that we already mentioned on the show notes of this episode at the official page, datascienceatom.com. This was Kevin McNamara from uh, Parallel Domain, founder and CEO of Parallel Domain. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thanks so much, Francesco. You've been listening to Data Science at Home Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or Podbean to get new, fresh episodes. For more, please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or visit our website at datascienceathome.com.